Hi, everyone, and welcome to this whole education hour. We just got through a final debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and hardly education was mentioned. Our second half of the show, we might have a very surprising guest to finally jump into the education game. Donald Trump does not mention anything in education, but uh, after tonight, I think we saw some historical things that have happened. And uh, so I, my two guests are on the line. First of all, I want to welcome the program, my co-host, Jason, the public school guy. Jason, how are you? And I know you were analyzing the debate. Oh, I'm doing well, and yes, I was. You were taking a look at it and saying, well, I ever see this in history. Again, I also want to welcome the program, my other co-host and also personal assistant, social media expert, Peter Alvin. Peter, how are you? I'm doing great. And, yeah, I just saw the debate. And- I have thought, trust me. <laughs> so all of us, and I have to break it down tomorrow uh, with a guest we possibly are going to have at 1130 Eastern tonight, which for our audience listening on Fridays are like, what, 1130 Eastern? Yes, 1130 p.m. Eastern, one of the old, the latest shows. I get people saying it's too late, even if you're on the West Coast, that's really sad. But I thought the first topic we want to jump into today, and then I might throw it, a jump into something else, but I think that it's very interesting, is how do we discuss the, uh, this, this election and uh, with children, especially in schools, to see such divisiveness on both sides, how much there was hatred between the two candidates, how can we teach, us, uh, teach our kids this political process in a way that's not going to cause controversy? Now, Jason's going to mention it in high school, and I would mention how I would handle it maybe in elementary school. So the first question goes to Jason. Jason, how how are you handling this? Um, to be honest with you, I didn't have uh, – I only had my seniors uh, in psychology watch this debate. Um, and they're analyzing for psychological techniques to put the other person on tilt. I don't – I didn't think that this debate, this this last one, was going to actually have much information in, involved in it. I was, I was actually wrong. There was actually some substantive policy that was discussed. Um, but when it comes to discussing, um, I don't allow the kids to use vitriolic language. They're not allowed to talk about uh, the candidates that they don't like in a way that is um, controversial or emotional. Um, if you have a point you want to make, you have to bring up facts. You, you're not allowed to just say things. Yeah. Um, and and, and you basically, you teach them how to be an adult and have an, have an adult disagreement. Um, but, that's, but that's a problem because, you know, most of my students and most of everybody's students in high school, they parrot what their parents want uh, and what their parents say. Um, you got to be careful not to, to put down anybody's point of view. Um, because everybody's point of view is valid to a certain extent, um, and, and these are young young voters, so you want to make sure that they um, that they don't feel as if that their voice doesn't matter. But I also want to make sure that they understand that there's a that, that, that if they're going to get into this world, that they that they do so with respect to the people around them. Um, they're not allowed to say the word. They're not allowed to say Clinton. It's Secretary Clinton. Uh, they're not allowed to say Obama. It's President Obama because the office, whether you like the person who fills the office, the office deserves respect. Um, and if I handle it that way, it generally tends to work out a lot better than 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 otherwise it would have. I have just been informed by a producer, someone that's taken a long hiatus, is back after maybe six weeks. Jared, Jared, how are you? Welcome back to the show. Uh, I know you definitely want to chime in on how you would teach this as well to students, the, the election, and this process. Wow. From beginning to end. Yeah. Who is that loser on the other end of the line that's making all those ridiculous, uninformed statements? <laughs> uh, first of all, I gave my kids homework to, to watch the debate, so we'll go there. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Welcome back, Jerry. <laughs> and I, so, in other words, when you teach about debate, you actually teach them the opposite of what we do on this show, which is never let facts get in the way of our opinion. <laughs> <laughs> True statement. True statement. <laughs> uh, okay, so, Jerry, how would you handle this? And I'm to get. Uh, hear Peter's stance as being in school and 
when they've discussed debates after debate. Kind of leading up to the reason, Jared, I brought this up is because I, I, I was interviewing someone from Scholastic today uh, about, you know, their process of the election and how already Hillary Clinton won that election and they have a ballot and people vote online and they also vote. There was a landslide. That, uh, well, it, kind of here's how that, I would – Here's how I would have handled it. Instead of giving them homework of watching the debate, my homework would have been watching the Chicago Cubs and the Los Angeles Dodgers play in the playoffs because I think that's more – that potentially has greater impact and greater history than any election that happens, what, every four years. (laughs) No, I I disagree. This one – this debate process. But, okay, that's that's Jared's take. Now, Peter, what has you had in your experience when you were in school involving the process of discussing uh, political candidates and the election? Yeah, so it was a rather interesting experience. So during while I was in school, we had – uh, we actually had two classes merged into one, uh, you know, with four teachers. You know, two did uh, English and then two did social studies. And when we got uh, close to uh, one of the debates uh, while we were in school, um, what we would do is, uh, you know, we, well, we did a couple of different things a couple of different times. So basically the one that I remember the most is that we were all, you know, we all decided which, you know, which uh, party we were supporting, you know, so then we all grouped together. And then what we did is, you know, it was a span of, I would say, probably a couple of weeks, uh, if I remember correctly. And basically you would all talk, you would gather facts about, you know, what what candidate you're supporting. uh, And then you would go through a series of trials to figure out who your best person was. Um, You know, this could include like, you know, like doing presentations, PowerPoints, videos, whatever it might be, uh, which was an interesting thing for for, uh, my personal experience. Uh, so that you can learn about the candidates as well as, you know, learn about what your personal views are, um, as, you know, and including doing kind of, you know, doing a really fun project where you can voice your thoughts in, yes, like you said, a, a respectable manner, you know, that you have to respect, you know, the offices, you have to respect the, the candidates out you also have to respect your peers uh, who are, you know, debating against you. Um, and then at the cultivating at the end, you know, you would have your, your two main people, uh, they would make, you know, uh, presentations and points. You, you know, we had like a moderator, you know, obviously uh, it, it, uh, you would think it would be a teacher, but it actually was, a, it was actually appointed by a student. Uh, so that was an interesting thing as well uh, so that they could ask the particular questions from a student standpoint to the teacher standpoint, uh, not only to learn from the, not only to learn from the other students, you know, what their points of views are, but also uh, to kind of, um, uh, make people think of their own questions. You know what I mean? It's it, but that's my most memorable uh, experience because that was during you know the last uh, couple of years of my uh, high school experience, um, and it was just it was really fun. It was really educating, and you know uh, we had a good time. You know, for the most part, people were respectful. You know, obviously there's those points where you get emotional, but uh, for the most part, it went it went as a success in my opinion. Very interesting. So that's where it doesn't cause trouble. But this election, with the opinions, I could imagine myself teaching fourth and fifth grade. I love how everyone kind of doesn't have any strategy to teach the lessons. And it's not over yet, but and for Scholastic it is. So they already had their mock elections, even in the battleground. With the election? Oh, yeah, the, the, election the election's election. been over for months. No, you just have to vote. No, no, I understand that. Oh. They just have to vote. Right. That's Classic because Hillary Clinton, Hillary, Donald Trump has already said that Hillary Clinton has rigged the election. So Jason absolutely. Is absolutely right. <laughs> but that's not what we're trying. So the way I would handle uh, a situation like this is how do we discuss this with our children? How do we make sure when there is such uh, – I, I, I mean, again, everyone wanted John McCain to go after Obama – for specific relationships. Everyone wanted uh, Mitt Romney to bring up Benghazi, and they did. And I think that what it shows those two people is that they saw the office of the presidency as something that did not, that they needed to go on the major issues and things that are talking points for both parties. Those two people chose not to do it. And they probably helped their legacy forever by not bringing up things like this, even though it could hurt 
the candidate and change the election. But their mindset, they wanted to talk about issues to make the country better, both John McCain and also uh, uh, Mitt Romney. Uh, Go ahead. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that with John McCain. But, Neil, the, the different candidates for the Republican Party is that, well, uh, there's a lot of big differences, but, but one of the differences is that, that Trump, instead of having surrogates, say, make these ridiculous accusations and, and, uh, and statements, he actually says them. So you can say that Mitt Romney, did not make wild accusations about Obama, but he certainly had other people out there doing it. And, you know, McCain actually did for the most part, it's, if you, if you watch the HBO movie about Sarah Palin and, and can, you know, trust it's, it's factual content, which I think it is um, fairly factual. He did want to stay away from, from negative politics. And he, he didn't really want surrogates going out there in loud accusations. But the Republicans have been doing this, and to the Democrats too, but the Republicans have been running campaigns this way for the last 25, 30 years, where maybe the candidate doesn't come right out and say this, but there's plenty of other people. Newt Gingrich, for one, is one of those oh, yeah. surrogates. No, see, see, the, and, but what I'm saying to you, not those points, not that we're on a debate stage, they chose not to do this. What is that there were times of disagreement in the last two presidential elections, even with uh, Gore and Bush, uh, and, and, then, and also um, Kerry and Bush. However, there was never to this point of hatred that is occurring in this election between the three debates. So how do you discuss this with fourth and fifth graders? And that's where I'm going in this direction. The second half of the show, we're going to be talking educational policy. What, I guess, uh, Secretary uh, President Hillary Clinton will do to change this education system, we are possibly, and again, my producers are saying we're possibly going to have a superdelegate from California, Democratic superdelegate, from California on the line to talk education policy and the plans uh, for the Democratic Party moving forward. Uh, and it'll be an interesting kind of conversation for the second half hour. So when we get back, you're listening to Education Hour on 88.3 WRCT in Pittsburgh. And we're streaming live at WRCT.org, hashtag WRCT. When we get back, Jason, the public school guy, Jarrett and Peter Elvidge will deal with Neil Haley. And he is, again, playing his role as journalist. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back at the Public Station Hour on 88.3 WRCT in Pittsburgh. And we're streaming live at WRCT.org, hashtag WRCT. And when it cracked me up, the first 10 to 20 minutes of the day, Donald Trump's talking like this. And then his blood starts boiling more. And then he gets angrier. And he gets angrier. But Hillary got even more ha- angry. And if literally she would have shown that same thing with any other Republican candidate, she loses. Bottom line is she picked the perfect shill or she paid the perfect shill to go ahead and have this fake election, in my opinion, that Donald Trump. She didn't pay anybody. Easy to conspiracies. It was the Republicans who chose him. Uh, No. The Republicans wanted him. Because because the Clintons are geniuses. They basically. Uh, (laughs) So so you're you're going to scapegoat your own party. Nice. I definitely, I don't know, my own party. I'm embarrassed. Yeah. Politically all together for all this. Reason. Neil, but, what about what about the Republicans, <laughs> the the rank and file Republicans that actually think that Donald Trump won the second debate? I mean, d- d- say how the. D- now, on Jerry, on Jerry Springer, he won the second debate. If you're a great rating on basically uh, uh, making someone look like a fool, he won the second debate. But it didn't, you mean it making didn't himself tell. look like a fool? I would say you mean he, making Hillary Clinton. But see, this is all. Oh my show. gosh, Neil! Right. You you couldn't have been watching the same debate. Uh, I we can break this down, but that's for another show and another place. Maybe we'll create a show to discuss that. But <laughs> honestly, it was just it was the biggest joke in the world. And, and they and Trump tonight. Uh, came out and was told, was uh, basically 
being a puppet until halfway through the debate where he got very, very angry. But Trump, the was, Trump was being a puppet? He was being a puppet that was being controlled by Breitbart and the entire machine the first 30 well, those, minutes. Those are the, were, that's the Republican machine right there. Yeah. Yeah, right. But but he changed the, and he didn't Breitbart say the Breitbart, the line. voice, is a Republican he machine. He would have, yeah, that's what I'm saying, for sure. I believe, well, this, uh, this is my take, I believe that if we're looking at analyzing this debate, if Donald Trump could have had discipline like the first 20 to 30 minutes, he would have won the debate. However, he literally got upset and angry. Hillary got upset and angry. So, but that's not the point. When? The point tonight? If, if people watch, oh, yes, I could play the That's debate because for, he has no Peter, discipline. Peter, Peter, but Hillary really has no discipline either. Peter, let's get to your point. Peter's what? in the middle. Did, did you believe at times Hillary was getting too angry and screaming too loud, Peter, in that debate? No. I, I believe they were, they were both having issues at, at multiple different points. Uh, but yeah. in my personal opinion, they both got issues. <laughs> right, exactly. But again, they both got issues. So what did Hillary do? She got Donald Trump to run it. Again, all the brothers, all all the wrestling fans out there, not fans, all the pro wrestlers believe it's a work. And I believe that election's a work. And I'll flat out there in my conspiracy for days to to come because if you would think of the greatest a uh, way to make, I have a conspiracy, Jared. You ready for this? Day, <laughs> okay, no, yeah, I, 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 I have a conspiracy that Opus yes, Day create that Opus Day created this. Okay, in, in no. order to in, in an effort to create a more perfect Christian no, person. No, 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 no. This is an Opus Day no, thing. No, I'm, I'm, no, I'm putting that out. No, no, absolutely. No. That's my no, conspiracy this, for the day. No, no, no. This this conspiracy. Absolutely, is real. Neil. This, 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 if I'm, I'm, going this is my real conspiracy. conspiracy. Jason, okay, here's the thing. They are good friends. Clinton Neil, Neil, Trump has not, not shown specific things honestly that he has a better oh. business mind. But this is not truly <laughs> Donald Trump. This is an absolute <laughs> make money through this country type thing. But what, I just want to go into how you teach this debate. And the way you teach it is very simple, okay? And so here, here's how you would, you would teach it, all right? You want to basically explain that both candidates are using mudslinging tactics and go back to history about it and not take a role, especially talking fourth and fifth graders. Say that they, especially tonight's debate, if we were in class tomorrow and we had to discuss this, I would just talk about temperament. I would talk about charity and how uncharitable that debate was. Not to shake hands. We have football players that play against each other and play uh, the heck out of each other. And yes, they'll shake each other's hands at the end. If our country can't even get along Democrats or Republicans and cannot even shake each other's hands, we have to talk about the history of modern-day elections and how terrible we've become. And in a way to say that, you know, the way to conduct yourself and not have arguments and, and things like that, and so really go into issues. Good news that there were issues this week for the, this, this uh, the third third debate. There were issues. What, so what, issue, share, what issues are you going to explain to these to these fourth and fifth graders that they're going to be able to understand? You're going to explain to them the idea of oh, it, insolvency of the uh, of the t- entitlement programs. These kids are going to understand that. See, honestly, they, Jason, they will. And, and Jared will come. No, they Jared won't. Talk you got a You have, you have Jared, educated Jared, adults who don't Jared, understand that. Jared, 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 Jared can you teach, don't, don't, don't know how you would teach that. Uh, Jared, well, I mean, you can you can mention. I, I think you could explain it in a way that uh, you certainly wouldn't use the the term entitlement, but no, you not could all. you could explain it in a way that that describes what. Entitlement programs are, and and quite honestly, I don't even like the the, the name, but because it, it's not an entitlement, it's something that that everyone pays into, everyone is a part of it, and, and because you well, might, they're entitled to it. That's the idea behind an uh, entitlement program. Well, program. they're entitled to it because of every because as a society we have a duty and an obligation. It's not. It's not like the spoiled, entitled uh, child who attends a private academy. 
it's not that regard. It's entitled. It's something that belongs to everyone. And, and that's the issue that I have when we use the word entitlement. It, it, it really has an it almost seems unearned and and something that that is undeserved and it's not that at all it, it's it's actually the opposite it's deserved because it's what we do as a society see and the way I would teach it and see Jason this is what should be taught and it's, it's broken down into more of a situation we're looking at our entire debt. And I would take it in a specific situation, a lot of what we're talking about, is that both sides believe that they can end this debt, okay? So we don't own so much money to China, and, uh, and, and we can reduce the debt and explain that one part of the party believes that, uh, and this is different, Hillary does not want to spend the kind of money she wants to raise taxes. That's how she's going to raise money uh, compared to Obama, President Obama. And that's the honest truth. But again, that's the, the re because you can't continue to borrow money. So she has a sense of uh, what uh, President Clinton was able to do. But the way you discuss this is, you know, you have a budget and you only have a certain amount of money as as a family for groceries and different things like this. And if we have a budget and we go over our budget, then we're going to run out of money at some point in time. And then here are the results. The results are we aren't going to be able to have dinner tonight. We're not going to be able to go out to the movies. We're not going to be able to. So you explain things in those types of terms. So when they talk about these programs, they're here to help people that need our help. However, one side believes that you shouldn't have as many because we don't have any money. So you have the strict budgeter versus the person who is, has a little more leeway, and that's how you have that conversation. But talking about Neil, that's, that great, you're you're making it way more complicated. Um, because I don't, if I were if I were teaching this to fourth and fifth graders, yeah, I think fourth and fifth graders will have more knowledge it, from high school. It, 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 it's it's that I, I it's much simpler than that. The Republican Party. In the Democrat Party, their basic difference is that Republicans don't think that the federal government should be involved in this. They think they see the federal government having very, very strict limitations as to what they can do. And if you want to have those programs, Republicans, conservatives will say, if you want to have those, you need to have them at the state level. Democrats would argue the opposite and say that you can't ensure or or guarantee school access by allowing states to to, to manage this. You you need the federal government to set rules and guidelines, like the Department of Education. And what but they I think do. we're going we're going we're going down a line to uh, explain things. It's a very interesting point. You could go to each policy. I remember in Scholastic when I taught the election, the last one uh, between Romney and Obama, President Obama and, uh, and Governor Romney, uh, that we really went into each policy issue, who's for and who's for and against in fifth grade. So Jason's wrong, absolutely wrong. The only problem now is... <laughs> The only problem now. How, how am I wrong? I didn't even say anything. We need to break it down because honestly, Scott will break down each one of the topics and explain it in detail. And honestly, some of the history that's taught in fifth grade is the same history that's taught in high school. So, yes, it will be. Exciting. Yeah, that's why it's called history. It's the same. Exactly. Can, so, <laughs> it so, has can a, I, if it changes it, people. And I, I wonder if I'm going to be safe on Bell with uh, our guests calling in. If not, I'm in deep trouble to get through this because you guys want to debate me tonight. And and I, I was just being trying to be as disciplined as possible. Might be joking around <laughs> about this entire conspiracy, just like my I told you about the conspiracy war. And Deer hit me because I knew the conspiracy that comes winning the World Series last year. But I, I mean, and so remember that story. I don't think Jared missed that story. And Peter's like, I'm an entertainer. I'm not here as a journalist per se on this show. If I was on this show, journalist, I'd have journalistic integrity when I interview the greatest people in the world in all areas of life. 
But when you're having a conversation on this show, it's got to be opinion. I used to have a totally different opinion seven years ago. But really looking at both and how crazy this this election is, how could it, it, it's the most best scripted reality television show ever. The ratings are the greatest, and who wins out? The networks. Who wins out? The uh, the candidates, because they're going to be able to write books on this story. They're going to end up making much more money and have stories about each other to their bases forever. So I want to know, Neil, are you, are you going to buy a subscription to Trump TV? Say, <laughs> I, 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 see, see, again, so here you go. You see the whole process. Are you are you going to buy a Trump, subscription to Trump TV? No, absolutely not. I, I hope that. Why not? Uh, the, well, I will try to get an interview with him after it's all over. I was supposed he to loves, interview Eric He loves Trump, God. To, oh yes. Yeah, so when we get back, Trump, Trump is we'll Trump is all about God now. Uh, uh, see, see, that's that's the funny that I never we were never hearing that, or he would have really said how he apologized. <laughs> And my favorite things are Saturday Night Live. But again, this is all about this unbelievable reality show. How do you teach? How do you teach kids this? And we'll continue the conversation. I want to argue this, but I'm also arguing the point. This is the greatest reality television show ever. You're listening to Tulsa Hour, eight point three. Not not to this point. Eighty-eight point three WRC. And we're. We're streaming live at WRCT on our hashtag WRCT. We get back. Jason, the public school guy, Jared, and Peter Alvin to let Peter have a sense to our crazy conversation. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back to the education hour at 88.3 WRCT in Pittsburgh. And we're streaming live at WRCTR.org, hashtag WRC, hashtag Ed Chat. I'm just saying, I mean, if you would look at the, the, the craziness that have been that has been said in this election to the point where Donald Trump literally said he's not going to concede the election, which really is the most moronic. That thing is the unprecedented. So, 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 unprecedented for sure. And again, I was watching CNN. You're like, okay, so he's neither. because again, they're even Al up. Gore conceded the election when okay, okay, we're, we're, it was stolen it's, from him. <laughs> it's, 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 it's great history. It's great history. I agree. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the hanging chat another time. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I like my pregnant so, chat. Uh, I like my chat's pregnant. <laughs> so, so, so Jason and Jared, were, we, I want Peter Elvich to kind of give some sense to this craziness. Before we have to talk education, uh, the second Good half luck. hour, kind of how to teach the presidential election. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Peter, what is your thought process? So good to have, you, have you back, Jared. You go, Peter. Oh. Say again? I didn't, I didn't quite hear you. No, the question of the point I want to make is go ahead with some sense of what Jared and Jason are saying and how to teach the presidential election and how fifth, fourth and fifth graders can't understand and how really they can if it's broken down right and how would you make it so that if you were teaching a class, you made sure that the controversy wasn't there. And our, our guest is on the line, so let Peter get the last word in before our guest, uh, before we put our, our guests on the line to talk education in the second half hour, involving uh, uh, with our super delegate. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh. Yeah. I mean, I mean, ultimately, some some of the thoughts that I have are, uh, you know, for teaching students, you know, I would say start with, you know, uh, what's necessarily not the proper things to do or not necessarily the, um, you know, uh, I guess, uh, uh, professional way of doing things, that's a good way to start. Um, also, my curiosity has been, too, is how, you know, how teaching this to, you know, because, I mean, we're generalizing uh, of all students. I mean, I'm curious on a specific level how we would teach this to persons with dis- with various different disabilities. I'm also yeah. curious to that as well, because even if you broke it down, um, could you break it down enough or could you explain it enough to various different disabilities? That's also something to consider as well. All right, so uh, this is an interesting uh, situation. We've been talking about superdelegates uh, throughout this election. So I do have a California superdelegate on the line, and I'm just going to – I'm excited to uh, welcome on the show uh, superdelegate Mary Ellen Early. Mary Ellen, thanks for calling. How are you? And you're a superdelegate in California, correct? That's right, Neil. I'm a member of the Democratic National Committee 
Uh, Superdelegate is a term that was coined by the media. What we really are is unpledged delegates. Yeah, so can you define that as an education show as you love? I, again, I got I, again. That's your PR. <laughs> I apologize for that point, but kind of tell why we're doing board super delegate and how that was really important in the discussion for the for the Democratic uh, nomination. The Republicans yeah. do not have super delegates. Uh, super delegates oh. include Democratic uh, members of Congress, Democratic members of the U.S. Senate, Democratic. Uh, governors and members of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, after 2008, we uh, eliminated a number of categories where every state got to pick like five additional unpledged delegates. A lot of them went to uh, people who were politicians, no longer in office, etc. So those have been eliminated. Uh, we, are, we do not have more votes than any other person who's a delegate. Uh, our vote counts just the same as anybody else, and a lot of us um, have, made, uh, have made endorsements prior to the convention. Uh, unpledged delegates were created originally to uh, make sure that we didn't have any, uh, any candidates for president who could not be elected, so they kind of went in favor of uh, party regulars, people they, uh, people they knew they could count on. And uh, as a member of the Democratic National Committee, I'm pretty much a grassroots activist. I help the party. Uh, I, how should I say it? I go on my own dime. I attend meetings all over the country. When I go to conventions, nobody pays my way. I pay my own way. Uh, I raise money for the party. I go and speak for the party um, very often at schools and senior centers and places like that. So I don't make any money off of being uh, being an unpledged delegate. Okay, well, thank you. that's fantastic, Mary Ellen. And we're going to get right into the topic, and I'm just going to open it up to conversation Let's talk about education. What do you feel okay. that Secretary Clinton is going to do uh, next if she's elected president involving education? Your, your thoughts on that. And then we'll get okay. some people asking some questions again. Are we, are we talking about affordability of higher education? We can talk about That's, anything in education. There's so okay. much to talk about. Early okay. childhood education. Right. In, our, in our half hour discussion, we can definitely get into that. Okay. Right. Well, Hillary Clinton believes in quality public education, not just from, not just K-12, but she also believes that we should have quality preschool available to all children, particularly people who live in communities of color. This will better prepare them to be successful in school. And in terms of higher education, and you can read it in the Democratic Party platform, she believes that Community college and state universities uh, should be tuition free for households that make under $125,000 a year. And she also believes that the people who benefit from this type of education should work at least 10 hours a week to show that they're really serious about that education. Okay, so let's go for a first question. We're going to go with Jared, because Jared, again, a question for Mary Ellen. Okay. Um, are we staying? Are we staying with education? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I know you love because kind of make us a political discussion. We'll, we might get into that. We're <laughs> talking education. Well, uh, um, but, yeah, okay. Uh, no, I I certainly agree that that I'm in. I'm, I support the idea of of uh, publicly funded higher education. Um, I guess what I would ask is how can we pay for that? And, and the other side of that is I've, I've heard uh, to continue with that is I've heard this idea of we then could in effect, tell the student what they need to do or, or, or like you mentioned the 10 hours of, of work. Um, how does that, 
what what's what does that demonstrate by by making that kind of regulation or that kind of rule? Uh, shows a commitment to hard work. When I was going to college, it was practically free. It was so uh, inexpensive. I was speaking to an undergraduate at UCLA who is uh, an out-of-state student. Her tuition is 27000 a year. Now, when I first went to UCLA, I came from Illinois. The out-of-state tuition I paid was 2700 a year. So you can see that's really gone up. And how do you pay for it? By making the wealthy pay their fair share. And if you listen to Secretary Clinton tonight, uh, her feeling is that we can afford a lot more things in this country if the top 1% are paying their fair share. Well, she believes that everybody making over $250,000 a year should be paying their fair share. And I agree, the super wealthy now pay less money in taxes than they did during Ronald Reagan's administration. Okay, so let's go to Jason with a question. Um, My question is, uh, how are you? I'm a member of the uh, of the Pennsylvania State Education Association, the affiliate of the NEA. Um, okay. When I went to the when I went to the um, conference this summer, um, and and Secretary Clinton spoke to us, she mentioned the fact that she wanted to include all interested parties in discussions when it comes to education from the K-12 level. Um, specifically, mm-hmm. she mentioned charter schools. What mm-hmm. role do you think that she would have? I mean, I obviously am. I have a, a very strong uh, opinion against charter schools. But what role do you think that Secretary Clinton would want to have uh, charter schools to ha- to have in public education? Okay. Well, if you look at the Democratic platform, it says mm-hmm. that charter schools that are doing well should continue, but those those that are profit making and trying to make a profit from the taxpayer money, which is, you know, where the school board, that should not be allowed. And um, I I have a lot of friends who are teachers, they're union members, and they work really hard, and a lot of them put their own money into buying supplies for their classrooms. And they shouldn't have to. Surely. You know, yeah. so it's it's hard to um, to stop, but if it's a nonprofit, charter school that's doing a good job, that's one thing. But so many of them are pro- come from profit-making chains. Right. And that, so, so, that so should part, not be so allowed. The, so I just want, for the sake of clarity, the position is that as long as it's a non-profit organization and it is mm-hmm. performing a good service for the student, therefore yes. it, that would make a, 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 an acceptable charter school. Yes. But what if it's okay. what if it's a school that makes a profit but does an equally good job, or or perhaps even a better job? I don't know if yes. there is okay. some, a, a school but, out there that does that. But well, but the question is, how be? are they making the profit? Are they making the profit off the backs of non-union teachers? Mm. Yes. Well, I would agree. The answer to that is right. yes. <laughs> okay. Well, but you could say, are they making a profit because they manage the money better or they manage resources better? Mm. Um, I mean, there could be a lot of explanations. But but the real argument is that is that should we penalize a charter school simply because it makes a profit? Conceivably, 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 it could... Yeah. It, it conceivably yeah. it could make, and first of all, more importantly, simply because you're nonprofit does not mean you run in a deficit. I work no, in a but what it does it, it does take it, away it, from what your motivation doesn't, is. It doesn't it doesn't mean that you don't make money. Uh, I no, but it does take away from your primary that. motivation. I'm well, if you make profit, the money you make goes back into the schools. Exactly. If you're nonprofit, the money should go back into the schools. Too many schools have lost 
there are programs for art and music, and those are a very important part of education. And um, so if a, if a school is a nonprofit, then they should be putting whatever money they make back into the uh, school and uh, the students. Schools okay. were cutting those Mr. programs Jones, long before the proliferation of right. charter schools. Right. Right, right. I, I have an argument for Jarrett and, and to agree with Mary Ellen and agree with Jason. You, but we have to take a break. You're listening to the Education Hour on 8.3 WRCT in Pittsburgh, and we're streaming live at WRCT.org, hashtag WRCT. We get back, Jason, the public school guy, Jarrett, Peter Elvidge, and Mary Ellen early, and she's getting into specifically enough for-profit charter schools versus non-profs. And it's very interesting. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back to the Education Hour at 88.3 WRCT in Pittsburgh. And we're streaming live at WRCT.org, hashtag WRCT. Jason, the Polish school guy, Jarrett, Peter Elvich, myself, Neil Haley, and Mary Ellen Early. And so we call you a delegate from California, right, Mary Ellen? We don't want to say yes. super delegate anymore, right? I'm, I'm an unpledged delegate. I, I'm playing. Okay. So, so how would you, when you introduce yourself, how do you introduce yourself as uh, when uh, people ask what, you, what, do, what do you do as a delegate? Well, I say I'm a member of the Democratic National Committee. I've been elected to eight four-year terms, so the people who elect me must be happy with uh, what I'm doing. I'm very proud to represent California at the national level. And uh, I'm, it's also wonderful to go to meetings all over the country and meet other Democrats and exchange ideas. Here in California, I, I do a lot of public speaking. I go to schools. I go to senior centers. I go to Democratic clubs. Uh, tonight I, I spoke to uh, people in Westwood who were viewing uh, the Clinton and Trump debate at one of the movie theaters and we had, we took questions and really good exchange of ideas. Yeah. I'm looking forward to to breaking down the debate tomorrow with you uh, tomorrow morning. So uh, it's crazy about 12 hours from now, as I did text you about a a later time. Let let me, let's go, let's go right into, um, I just grew Jarrett and agree with you that, Mm-hmm. That they should not be for profit schools, and the money should go back to the schools, not to the corporation, not to the leaders who are running it. It should all be put mm-hmm. back into the schools. Like for example, hospitals, they make a, such a huge profit. Hopefully, most of it in these nonprofits go back to uh, the organization. Sometimes they don't do those things, but we know for a fact in Pennsylvania, and Jason will agree with me on this. There are so many for-profit charter schools, right, Jason, where oh. people making the money are the people running it, right? Well, this, 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 we've had a, a series of prosecutions in Pennsylvania uh, for, uh, for the leaders of these for-profit institutions um, and, 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 and because their motivations are different. I mean, profit versus non-profit, the motivation is very different. Uh, if you're a for-profit business, your one motivation is singular. It's making money. Uh, and you do so by all means possible. Um, but I, I did have one other question when it comes to, to, to charter schools is that um, I, I don't know how it's run in, in California, but in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, charter schools are run, uh, they don't have the same rules as the public schools in which they compete with. Um, they don't have to take in students with disability. They don't have to modify anything for students with disability. They can cream the students who go in there. Are the rules mm-hmm. the same in California? And I mean, to the point because we, we are talking about the election cycle. Um, even if a, if it would would, do you know or do you believe that uh, Secretary Clinton would also agree that charter schools, public or profit or or nonprofit, should have to run by the same rules as their public school counterparts? Uh, I agree that that's the case that they should. I'm not sure they always do, and I think. Like you say, they skim the cream off the top, and what they leave the public schools with are the hardest to teach students. And then they say that the teachers aren't doing a good job because the uh, students aren't doing well in the test. Well, if you look at who the students are, you know, very often they're the hardest to teach. 
But there has been there has been charter schools in uh, in the inner cities that have done a good job. I just hope that they're uh, nonprofit charter schools that have given some of the young people who have uh, very little in the way of, um, uh, you know, a, a successful background, give them an opportunity to uh, succeed. But again, I know, I know in Los Angeles, it's um, the Los Angeles Unified School District has a huge uh, issue right now. There was a, a very successful charter school in the San Fernando Valley that they were going to yank the charter. And uh, they finally cut a deal where the uh, principal would, uh, would resign. Wow. So okay. now, uh, allow me to now, jump so in here. To um, first, there, Jared, I, I want to give Peter a chance for a question. Peter, do you have a question okay. for Mary Ellen? Yeah. Um, so I'm just, uh, in my opinion, throughout the the election, I just felt like disabilities have kind of suffered as to being, you know, talked about. And mm-hmm. I just, I need to ask this particular question. So, what is Secretary Clinton's plan? for, you know, having students with uh, disabilities getting a more of an inclusive education? Because I know I've heard her stances on it, you know, like that she's for but, like, what is the actual plan? Because I keep hearing, you know, positivity towards it, but I, I, I really want to know if you can tell me at least a little bit, uh, a little bit more in detail. Uh, I would have to check our charter, but I do believe that uh, Secretary Clinton is in favor of helping people who need that kind of help. And that's an issue near and dear to my heart because I have a nephew on the autism spectrum. And I know that um, he was lucky because his father had excellent insurance when he was going to school and he was able to do well in a public school. And he was even offered a teacher's aide to sit with him in school, but he turned it down because he didn't want to be seen as different by his classmates. And I think one thing Hillary Clinton has done all of her life is to support children and help them reach their full potential. If you look at the woman's background and what she's done, I think you'll see that she's very much in support of helping the less people who have uh, People who have fewer uh, fewer uh, things than we've had, who are middle class, uh, young people who need assistance. Uh, a lot of these kids right. go to school hungry because they don't have enough food. So, you know, school lunches, um, making sure these kids are safe. Safety in public schools in some neighborhoods is a big deal. And I think that's something you'll find that she she really feels is important. Some of it has to be taken care of by local school boards, but there are federal programs like the school lunch programs that can really help a lot of these kids because if you're hungry, you can't learn. So true. And I've seen that firsthand. Now, okay, so, uh, Jarrett, your question. Well, uh, first, Neil, um, I, I, I wish you wouldn't have misrepresented my um, statements regarding charter schools. I was simply, <laughs> I was simply, I mean, I think clearly I've demonstrated that it, that I'm not a, a, a supporter of charter schools, and I, I'm not quite sure that we can have it both ways that because Jason is correct. Charter schools are a tremendous drain on public education and more importantly to support charter schools and then simultaneously say that you support public schools is, is incredibly inconsistent because you can't do both because for every dollar that goes to a nonprofit charter school, it comes directly at the expense of public schools. And since charter schools do not have to operate on, on the same playing field, I, I simply cannot see how they can be funded publicly. 
so I, I know that your stance was that the difference between, and we're going to get off of that charter school because I do have a question. How is I, and this is, and this is again going into my thought process of the last two presidents when involved in education. How is Secretary Hillary Clinton going to be a better president for education than George W. Bush and also President Barack Obama? My opinion is that. President Obama's education plan with Secretary Arnie Duncan has been a complete, and I'm not going to use the word disaster, but I'm thinking about that. Now. I just, no, because that would have sounded like Donald Trump. Trump. I know, but I, I no, but I'm just saying, I think it's really a horrible. I just think that his education plan has been terrible. I like that sounds that like Donald Secretary, Trump. That affected Secretary. Uh, Hillary Clinton has that. I've read up on all the education plans. So my question for you, Mary Ellen, is how is she, how is she going to finally bring education back where I think in the last uh, 16 years we have gone backwards, not forwards? That's a good question. I believe that she will definitely be better than Donald Trump because I think he only cares about his own children getting a good education. But what I think of Hillary is that she believes that they're all our children, not just her own children and her own grandchildren, but she has a great love for children and a great love for education. I can't tell you specifically, but like I said earlier, she believes that we should have uh, preschool. It should start with preschool so that these Young people are better prepared when they go to kindergarten and grade school. And you're going to have to uh, look at her website, HillaryClinton.com, and see what she has to say about it. And I, and this is interesting that, that what Mary Ellen is saying, again, I think that the plan is better as well. And Jason and I have had this thing, you're believing it's going to be the same. Jason is not as sold on Secretary Clinton's plan just because of how she mentioned charter schools. But in your opinion, we're not going between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump has no education plan. Uh, absolutely not, except to kill the U.S. Department of Education off. Uh, I'm looking forward to see if we can get a surrogate to talk. Last time I had Governor Romney's possible surrogate, and it was a fantastic hour show four years ago. And uh, – the head of PSEA was on as well, and the, it was a fun combo. But I don't see any plan uh, for uh, Donald Trump when it comes to education except to get rid of the U.S. Department of Education. Now, Jason, why are you <laughs> concerned about the whole uh, situation about Secretary Clinton? Because a lot of people that wanted Bernie Sanders compared to Hillary Clinton for, for uh, education. Your thoughts, Jason? Well, again, my, my concerns, uh, Jared na- nailed one of my big concerns on the head. How can you support uh, a, a school alternative to public education when you're going to take the funding away from public education and expect both to be functioning at a high level? Um, the uh, some, some other concerns that I have that, that deals with education is this, the, the standardized testing, the over-testing of students. Utilizing standardized exams, um, uh, the, the the movement towards uh, assessing teachers based upon singular high risk exams, standardized exams, those are the kinds of things that bother me and and concern me. And, and the, all this part of the and I'm putting up in air quotes school reform <laughs> movement, um, uh, that, what they've been doing for the last twenty plus years has seemed to make come to fruition, and the, the fruits of that labor has been a decline, a steady decline in, in student performance on uh, international assessment techniques. Mm-hmm. What I'd like mm-hmm. to see, I mean, what, what concerns me is that Secretary Clinton, and I hope President Clinton, because I will be voting for it, but um, that, that she would pull away from some of those things. Do I think standardized testing is going to go away? No. But I think it should be de-emphasized. Charter mm-hmm. schools, cyber schools are concerns for me at this point. These are things that, that, that you know, if I were to sit down with Secretary Clinton in, in, in a conversation that I would bring up with her and, 
but I don't think that and, and, and what she did say to us at the NEA conference, because when she did bring up charter schools, we reacted in a very negative way. She, we, she was booed mm-hmm. for that. But I, but I will give her this credit, and, and that is that she said she brought it up to us, so she's not afraid to tell us what we don't want to hear. Uh, but then she also said, but you will also have a seat at our table. So that, 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 that takes away some of my angst, but that's my, those are my concerns when it comes to public education and what I hear – the Democratic, the, 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 the Democratic Party, the party that's supposed to be fighting for my union, circumventing us, Paul Begala supporting for-profit schools, you know, or people within the Democratic Party, people I've supported. What are we going? To, I mean, what are we as Democrats going to do about those people who have gone all in on charter schools? Mm-hmm. Mary, Mary Ellen, yeah, I, you got about a minute thirty to answer that question. <laughs> Okay. First of all, I think there's been too much emphasis on teaching to the exam, uh, but I I don't think the majority of Democrats are supportive of charter schools, uh, especially when they they know what happens that the the cream gets skimmed off the top, that a lot of them don't have to be uh, union schools. Some of them in Los Angeles are, but others are not. Uh, I think there have to be standards. And I think uh, you expect your leadership, and the President of the United States is a leader, to help set those standards and uh, come out in favor of what's right. Well, Mary Ellen, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate the fire firing squad I gave you today. Tomorrow we'll just break down the uh, debate. I found it fascinating, fun, and interesting. That's because I, okay. as a journalist, I love to look at these things and break them down. And Jason and Jared, I wish you could talk with us, talk with Mary Ellen tomorrow morning as well. But uh, thanks, guys, for calling. Appreciate it. And, uh, we'll chat soon. What, thanks, what Peter. Time thanks, I, what time am I calling in tomorrow? Uh, 8 a.m. Pacific. 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. Okay? I'll text you to remind you. All right. All right. Okay. okay. Thank All right. you. Thank you. All right. All right, take care, guys. All right, that was, again, that was the uh, that was the total education hour. What did we learn tonight? Well, we learned some very, very interesting things, and uh, and <laughs> I learned a lot as well about uh, my conspiracy. Honestly, I'm, I'm tongue in cheek when I talk about you know possibly Trump being in with Clinton. It's the greatest reality television show you'll ever see ever. Yet the American people are being hurt by it. Take care, guys, and we'll talk next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>